welcome back. So we're here for our last panel today. Um, when we're done, I'll leave it open just for a few minutes for any question and answer, just kind of wrap up. There's one or two things I wanna say and kind of show before we, before we wrap up for today, but thank you for being with us. I know people have had to come in and go out and I appreciate it if you've been here all day. I appreciate it if you just come in for a few panels. It's been very engaging and very thought provoking and thank you. So Madison Hatfield, who is another one of our LES scholars, will actually uh, present the last two presenters in this panel, Andrew Beck Grace and Connor O'Neill. Thank you, Madison. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the three o'clock panel. This session will feature Andrew Beck Grace and Connor Town O'Neill presenting Lillian Smith's influence on contemporary nonfiction storytelling in the South. Andrew Beck Grace is the co-creator and co-host of the NPR podcast, White Lies, which was a finalist for a Pulitzer Prize in audio reporting. His interactive documentary, After the Storm, was nominated for an Emmy in New Approaches to Documentary. He teaches nonfiction filmmaking and journalism at the University of Alabama. And Connor Town O'Neill is the author of Down Along with That Devil's Bones, A Reckoning with Monuments, Memories, and a Legacy of White Supremacy. He is also a producer on the NPR podcast, White Lies, which was again a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in audio reporting. He teaches at Auburn, Alabama, or Auburn University, excuse me, and with the Alabama Prison Arts and Education Project. During the session, we will be monitoring the questions and we'll choose some to ask during the last 15 minutes on the session. And with that, I will let y'all begin. Thank you. Cheers, thanks, Madison. Um, hey, hey, Connor, how are you? I can hear you, can you hear me? I'm assuming you can. Loud and clear. Killer. Um, how you doing? I'm good, I'm good. I'm excited, to, I'm excited to talk with you. I feel like I don't get to talk to you as much now yeah. that we are on hiatus from the podcast. Um, yeah, let's, let's hope it's temporary. I feel the same <laughs> way. Um, although we are now living in the same town, but there's Coco, so what are we supposed to do? You know, uh, I, know. I know. We visited in the backyard though recently, and for everyone who's watching, uh, we should all offer a hearty round of virtual applause for Connor uh, and his partner Shailen, who just had a baby one month ago in two days or something, right? Yeah, 32 oh. days old. You can hear her maybe in the background. <laughs> so that's very exciting for Connor. Uh, and her for all of are, us. Her lungs are very healthy, as you can hear. <laughs> that's good, that's good. Um, um, so so we talked, Connor and I talked briefly before the panel um, about how to do this. And I think what we're gonna do is just sort of, we're, we've got a kind of rough sketch of some questions to ask one another about our own work and about uh, Lillian Smith's influence on it. And then of course, we'll open it up for Q and A too. So I think that's how it's gonna go. But if, I, we would really appreciate hearing your questions. So if y'all wanna drop them in the, in the chat box, that would be wonderful. And I guess we'll get to those at the end of the panel. Um, so yeah, that's how we're gonna do this, yeah, I think. Absolutely. Um, yeah, so I mean, obviously, um, we, uh, we worked on, on White Lies together and, and uh, is really the reason why we're here at this, uh, on this panel talking about Lillian Smith, because as a part of the uh, research for that podcast, we all read, you, uh, you and I and Chip, the, the other co-host of the podcast, all read Killers of the Dream, I think on your recommendation. So maybe it makes sense to start there. Um, how did you first encounter Smith's work and, and what's the, what's the story there? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, I think we, it feels like it was, Smith was in the air a little bit already in a lot of the previous reading that we had done. So when we were making White Lies, Chip and I were the sort of hosts and producers and the people on the air, but Connor was a graduate student uh, with Chip and I when we first began working on this project and was a huge part of the initial research of White Lies. And then when we got with NPR, he became the most integral part of our team, basically. And so in, in many ways, what is not revealed on the radio and in the show is that the three of us were really making this project together um, in many ways. And Connor, Chip and I both being from Alabama, being older than Connor, if you can tell on video, <laughs> uh, you know, we, we had a, in Connor, a younger person who was an, extraordinarily thoughtful and well-read, but also not from the South. And so the ideas of playing off, but living in the South at the time that we were working on the show. So Connor was just an instrumental voice um, in making the show. And I think, so I say that all as a preface to say that we were all reading a lot of different things um, to think through Southern history, to think through memory, to think through um, how do we reckon with the past. And I'd be, I feel like Lillian Smith had been sort of in the water. So I'm not sure that it was me necessarily, mm. 
um, I feel like maybe I said I'm going to read it, and this is common in our relationship. You got it and read it before I did. Um, <laughs> the, the reason, the way that I came to Lillian Smith is um, as an undergrad at the University of Alabama, which is where I teach now, but also where I went to undergraduate. Um, I had the great fortune of being um, taught by Rose Gladney, who was a professor in American Studies. I was an American Studies major. My roommate and best friend, Joey Thompson, who now teaches Southern history at uh, Mississippi State, uh, he and I were both American Studies majors, and we just loved Rose and her classes. And um, one class in particular was called Southern Lives, where we read uh, a series of biographies um, of Southerners, and mostly white Southerners. Um, Rose, as you know, if you are uh, at all interested in Lillian Smith's work and have, have read any of her work, um, you know, Rose is, is probably the foremost scholar on Lillian Smith. And I think because her edition of Killers of the Dream came out around the time that, uh, that I was in that class, she actually didn't teach Lillian Smith the semester that I was in that class. Um, but I feel like she alluded to it a good bit. And Virginia Durr was someone that she did teach and someone that I did read um, as an undergrad. And I, or I, I can't even remember if she taught in the class, but it, Rose definitely introduced me to Virginia Durr and Lillian Smith. And so Virginia Durr, I got personally interested in because I am from Alabama and I uh, grew up here in a wealthy middle, upper middle class white family. Um, and the fact that I was reckoning with what it means to uh, try to articulate a Southern identity that wasn't like the perception of Southern identity in the rest of the country, it, it had become a kind of defining force in my life. How do I, how do I resist the South um, and the trappings of the South while still trying to figure out a way to make sense of the place, while still maintaining my relationship with my family, all these things that Smith does an extraordinary job of talking about. Um, and so I think that was really how I first got introduced to her. And I'd read the, the Durr stuff. I made a film about the Durrs called The Durrs of Montgomery for APT um, back in 2010 or 2012, around that time. Um, and in the process of researching that, I came across Lillian Smith a lot because uh, Virginia and Lillian Smith had a bit of a falling out. Um, it's a kind of, uh, you know, side note, not, not really that interesting, but they, there were just differing views of how to position yourself um, as a white liberal in the 40s and 50s and even uh, into the 60s in the case of the Durers. And so there was constant tension, right? Um, and so I think I was aware of her, I knew about her, and then the, the sort of killers of the dream I think I read like a blurb and it just was like, why have I not read this book? It's one of those things that happens often when you, when you read too much, you, you know, you feel almost like you've read something that you haven't read. Mm -hmm. um, in my first recollection of picking up the book, uh, which was only two years ago, I guess, when I first read it, uh, was just to be floored by, and you and I talked about this earlier, but how elegant the book is written um, and how persuasive it is and how, it just gutted me. I just saw myself so deeply in it and really wished that I had read it when I was like 20. I think it would have really mm -hmm. helped me come to some sort of racial awakening even before I did, or it would have made that cla that path clearer, I think. Um, and so that's really how I came to her work. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, I, I feel like she's not mentioned in the show, which is funny because Chip and I have talked about this a lot too, because every time Chip and I did a lot of press for, um, for the show after it came out, and we, we would constantly talk about, uh, but we'd talk about uh, Lillian Smith. It was like, we couldn't, so we couldn't really articulate why we wanted to tell the story we wanted to tell it without somehow name checking Lillian Smith, you know? Um, and so it's, it is ironic that she's not mentioned in the show at all, because she was a huge, huge source of inspiration for us. Um, I think, Connor, you probably remember one of those days when we had like, hundreds of sticky notes on the wall uh, when we were trying to plan how to, I'm sure her name and quotes from the book were up there trying to figure out how to integrate that into the show, you know? Um, yeah. 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 I think, you know, her, her perspective, I think, <laughs> sort of informed everything I've done from the, from the minute I picked up that book. Um, and I, and I, and, and so many of the ideas are, are sort of like in the, like in the, in the water of that, of, of, of white lies and, and, uh, I think partly because she's she's so perceptive at, at talking about big political structural ideas, but also getting at the the real sort of individual psychological realities of that um, of the sort of psychotic <laughs> nature of how race works in America. Um, and so, in doing you know conspiracy theories and this sort of detachment from reality is, is such a central part of um, 
essentially central part of white lies. And I think Smith hits on that um, in such a incisive and, and as you say, eloquent way. Um, yeah, I kind of wish there was like more room to do, uh, to talk more about some of the works that inform uh, inform that podcast. But I guess such is the nature of, of narrative storytelling that there's less room for um, talking about books. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, as you well, I, as you well know, I think, the three of us know this well because the, these are the conversations we had but you know we use that vehicle of the murder of Jim Reed we always thought about it as a vehicle to try to do that we wanted the subtext to be the pretext to the show but you can't tell an audience that you want the subtext to be a pretext it just has right. to be then it's not subtext anymore. Enough, you know um yeah. that, it, that it comes through and so I, I do think we we constantly thought about that but yeah it's not it's not there in the show and I will say what you just said reminded me of one of the things that's so persuasive and fascinating about her work and make, and I also think to the, to the sort of title of our panel here today, in terms of how the storytelling moves operated in our show, the vulnerability of a white Southerner to talk about their own racial awareness and their own racial history and to piece through, not in a defensive way or even in, a, in a, an explanatory way, but in a kind of gutted and sort of broken way, what it feels like to live a life predicated upon such systems of racial injustice and to have everybody around you pretend as though, I mean, everybody in the white community pretend as though this is not an issue, that we, the past is gone and we don't have to deal with it and to feel connected to some kind of deep uneasiness that informs you as a person about what your responsibility is to the past. And yet you turn around and no one around you in your life, none of your family members want to have that conversation, you know? And yeah. then I will say this as a Southerner, looking outward to people, you know, mentors of mine or people that didn't grow up in the South and, and sort of in a plaintive way saying like, I feel this pain about my identity and then having it refracted back onto me that, well, yeah, cause you're a racist cause you're from the South, you know, and your whole mm -hmm. family's racist and everything. it's just like, no, I'm, I'm in pain here, you know? And that what Lindley Smith does so well is the sort of deep human emotion of the white liberal, which I, you know, it's what she calls it. And that's really, that's I, there's not a better way to talk about it. And this is the stuff that really drew me to Virginia Durr and her husband Cliff Durr and why I got so interested in them is how do you, as a white person in the South, find a way to navigate a relationship with this really badly damaged place? Um, I keep thinking about an essay I wanna write, uh, which I'll probably never write, so I'll just lay the premise out for you, which is that the entire country under the Trump administration, and God knows what will happen if he's reelected, is essentially what it feels like. It, every person of conscious, white person of conscious in this country feels the way that I did as a child <laughs> about mm -hmm. how do you, how do you make excuses for this place? How do you live in this place? So it feels as though the, the American experience right now is what it felt like to be a white Southern liberal for my entire life. When it would be easy yeah. to step outside of this region and say, that's your problem because you're from this tortured, screwed up backwards place. But now I feel like everybody in the world is looking at us saying, well, that's your problem. Yeah, yeah, the, 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 the white Americans ability to, uh, abide contradiction is pretty um is pretty incredible um you know prepping for this panel has um as the kids say uh got, gotten me back on my bullshit um sorry for cussing that um but uh the, so i'm going to read to you this passage from from killers of the dream yeah, um, yeah. for for old time's sake uh, but i think it, it strikes out exactly what you're talking about um, I learned it is possible to be a Christian and a white Southerner simultaneously, to be a gentlewoman and an arrogant, callous preacher in the same moment, to pray at night and ride a Jim Crow car the next morning, and to feel comfortable in doing both. I learned to believe in freedom, to glow when the word democracy was used, and to practice slavery from morning to night. I learned it the way all of my Southern people learn it, by closing door after door until one's mind and heart and conscience are blocked off from each other and from reality. And one, as you were saying earlier, just the elegance of <laughs> writing there is beautiful. Kind of the, I learned to believe in freedom to glow in the word democracy is used and to practice slavery from morning to night. The twist of the knife there is it's beautiful. But but that that um, I think that image of the, the closing doors and the alienation um, and the, the paradoxes and absurdity of, of living in uh, a country that aspires to be a democracy and yet has this pernicious, violent racial hierarchy is, is crazy making, it deranges you. 
disconnects you from reality. Um, but she goes on to talk about doors opening then too and, and her, her trajectory of finding ways, experiences, ideas that, that start to open those doors and connect her to bigger ideas, um, which is similar to, you know, a journey that Virginia Durr went on to. Um, I, I may be asking you to speculate here a little bit, but I, I wonder if you have some idea about what it, that, that moment in the, in the 40s and 50s, what accounts for that kind of awakening of consciousness um, that, that white Southerners like Virginia Durr or uh, Lillian Smith were experiencing? Because I kind of feel like we're in that moment now and yeah, it might be yeah, useful yeah. to look at a historical moment or something similar was yeah. happening. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's really interesting. So, I mean, I think that Virginia and, Cl and her husband Cliff grew up in the sort of stayed white world without asking many questions about any of this stuff. Um, and it was really because of Virginia's brother-in-law, Hugo Black, who before he was a Supreme Court justice was working for the New Deal um, administration, FDR's administration that Cliff had had a sort of falling out. Cliff was always a man of principle and so was Virginia as a woman of principle. And there was a, uh, it's a fascinating story, I won't go into too much detail, but he had essentially left his law firm um, out of a manner of principle. Like he had, there was some terrible shit happening and it had to do with the formation of Alabama Power, which is why this is such a great story because Alabama Power is still a force of evil in this state. Um, anyway, and he just, he decided to, to leave his job and literally was, they were at their, their river cabin without knowing what they were going to do. And they had a small baby at the time and he gets this call from Hugo Black saying, look, we got plenty of jobs because the New Deal is opening up all these great opportunities for lawyers to be on oversight committees and blah, 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 blah. So they moved to DC. And I think in DC, even though the New Deal is rightly dinged for not at all uh, enfranchising African-Americans as much as it could have, or as much as it maybe s pretended like it was, um, there was a sort of awakening of what, what it might look like to really embrace some far left politics in this country. Um, and some ideas crib from communism and socialism and uh, and that, that there was an idea that you could really radically change a place and a people and their fortunes and their outcomes by changing radically their politics. Um, and race began to intrude on that throughout the New Deal. And so when the Durs came back to Alabama, and I'm going to mess up the date, but I think it was in the early, late 40s, early 50s, partly because of Cliff's health, he lost his job, he came back to just kind of do, they came back to Montgomery, and they came right at the moment when there was this racial awakening right before the Montgomery bus boycott started, um, and you know, just a few years before. And so that, you know, as we know from sort of doing this deep dive on civil rights history, what happens in Montgomery uh, with the boycott is is really the what you might think of as this kind of. There's lots of things that predated in the '40s that happened after Black soldiers returned, but but uh, from the war, and I mean, even we know from in Dallas County, the Voters League that starts well before the Montgomery bus boycott does, but the boycott is the thing that sort of pushes everything on the national stage. And probably the most famous thing about the Durs is that Cliff famously bailed out Rosa Parks from jail the night she was arrested because he was a white attorney who was helping Fred Gray, the black attorney in town, who really represented Mrs. Parks. He was the one who was sort of able to go down and actually pull her out of jail in Virginia famously like said, well, if you're going down to jail to get out of Rosa, I'm gonna come with you. Rosa had been there seamstress, like it worked for the family. Um, oh, wow. somebody that, that, um, that Virginia herself had taken to Highland, Highlander Folk School to have these kind of training programs about sort of this far left quasi-communist kind of worldview about organizing and labor organizing in the South. Um, so I think all that stuff's happening and that's, that's after Lillian, right? Like Lillian is writing this stuff, I think in many ways, Part of the schism with Virginia and Lillian is that she never really, Virginia never really, she felt like the little sister of Lillian because Lillian was so successful, mm. you know? And so she felt like she was articulating ideals and doing things in Montgomery that were important, but Lillian had sort of crafted her own world and had, and had really been extraordinarily successful as a novelist, had written these very interesting things. And so I think that was also a tension too, maybe in their relationship. Um, but it's a good question. I mean, like, what is in the water at that time? I mean, it, it probably is a lot of things. And one of it probably had to do with the fact that Black people were finally feeling after the war, like they could articulate a, an argument for inclusion. And that that mm. articulation, it would force white people who had been blind to this their entire lives or who had told themselves bullshit about you know, well, black people love to be separate or what, whatever kind of lies had undergirded their white supremacy, uh, anybody of conscious would probably have at that moment felt some tension in those worldviews. And I think you either neglect those tensions and pretend like they don't exist, or you lean into them to some extent and try to figure out how to, how to navigate them. 
clearly the leaning in and the navigating was a very small portion of people as, <laughs> and still to this day is a very small portion of people. Um, but I think that's what is unique about these folks. Um, and I will say just because your question reminds me of this, one of my favorite lines that I heard when I was working on the Durr film uh, was from a historian at UNC, Jacqueline, Jacqueline Dowd Hall, who um, basically said that in the 70s, and at this point, Virginia would have been in her 70s, Jacqueline and her friends as young scholars, they like made a pilgrimage to Montgomery because they felt so disenfranchised that this after the civil rights movement had ended, and these were white scholars, white liberals basically, and Southerners, that after the civil rights movement had ended, they, they, nothing happened, organizing stopped. There wasn't any, there was just nothing there. And they started reading mm -hmm. about these people, the Lillian Smiths of the world, the Virginia Durr's of the world. And so they went to go find her because as Jacqueline told me, she was, she was looking for a usable past. Uh -huh. And I just always loved that idea because it feels so apropos to the work that we do, which is the idea of finding something that can feel like you can hold on to it and gain something of value for it. So in the seventies, they wanted to go talk to Virginia about what was happening in the forties, you know? Mm. Um, and so I just, I love that idea of a kind of usable past. Cause I think even now revisiting Lillian Smith in 2020, the book that was written in the forties, we are looking for a usable past. We're looking for a place to find some meaning, you know, out of all the sort of paranoia and chaos. Yeah. Uh, and, and to find it in the past is, is gratifying in many ways. Well, and I think probably especially poignant as a Southerner to come at that. I mean, I think having grown up in Pennsylvania, we like to flatter ourselves that <laughs> we have we have a more usable past. Um, but but I but but I think uh, you know uh, uh, that that is a, a maybe a more poignant sort of Southern problem. Um, and it, it got me thinking as I was looking back at um, my copy of Killers of the Dream. I had skipped over the sort of front matter, I guess, the first time that uh, I read it. But I was looking at it this time, and the the edition that I have is a, a reprint and includes a letter that Smith wrote to her publisher. Um, I, th I guess in the early '60s, so you know, maybe 10, 15 years after she first wrote it. Um, and she she mentions that her her publisher had said to her that only a Southerner could have written Killers of the Dream. Um, that only someone who feels deep in their bone, the uh, perplexities and paradoxes of, of the place could have written something with the, the sort of searing, um, devastating insights uh, and sort of diagnoses uh, that, that Killers of the Dream has. She pushes back on that a little bit and is like, you know, uh, skeptical of the sort of essentialism of it, but does say that she sort of writes it as uh, as a Southerner. And I think that's certainly the orientation that you and, and, and Chip took to, to White Lies, two, two Southerners of a different generation coming back and, and ex excavating this, this civil rights cold case. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that, that orientation to the work. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think that we would not have felt, I don't know, I don't know. I was gonna say, I was gonna say something that I don't know if it's true, but I was gonna say, I think if we weren't from Alabama, I don't know how much we would have felt like we had to tell the story. Um, but being from Alabama and being white and knowing that our whiteness and our Alabamaness would allow us to get other white Alabamians to talk, mm -hmm. it just felt like it was a responsibility and also a way to work through a lot of stuff that, you know, Chip and I have been friends for a long time and a lot of stuff that we had talked for a long time about not knowing how to work through. Um, and so the idea that a story could help do that. Um, and to that point too, I mean, I think that you know, it, it forced us to think about our own, the ways that we would orient ourselves as white Southerners to this story. Um, and so one of the things that we talk about on the show and that we worked, as you well know, because you were in the middle of all this with us um, for a long time trying to do is how do you talk about, for instance, both our families own slaves. I mean, we, we own enslaved people. And so how do, you, how do you own up to that? How do you talk about the legacy of that? Um, how do you not dwell in it? Like we're, you know, it's it's a taboo and a, an embarrassment to my family, um, but it's also I'm not a victim because my family owned enslaved people. Like how do you how do you own that and work through it? Um, and Lillian Smith gave us an uh, an example of how to do that. You just be brutally honest about it. Talk about the pain of it. Talk about how you don't know what to do with it. You know, um, and you just try to do the work basically. Um, and I'm curious because uh, two things. One is that just the fact that you're not from Alabama and you've just written this marvelous book about this sort of Southern obsession with monuments as a, as a way of, as a lens of looking at white supremacy ideas operating throughout the country. Um, 
so yeah, what how does how does Elaine Smith work and and her response to the publisher? Because I didn't I didn't you told me this earlier today about this publisher letter. And I'm just curious what your what your orientation on that idea is. Like who who's going to do this work? Um, you're not a southerner. You just wrote a book that that deals with the South, and I think it's a wonderful book partly because you're not a southerner. So how do you how do you how do you square that? Yeah, I mean I think at at, at first part of the appeal of the of of um, of this book project, looking at battles over four different monuments of uh, Nathan Bedford Forrest, the Confederate general, slave trader, first Grand Wizard of the Klan, uh, accused war criminal, um, who has, you know, there are more markers of him in, in Tennessee than there are uh, of the three presidents from that state combined. <laughs> so, so over the past couple of years, I've been reporting on these campaigns to try and remove some of his, um, some of these monuments, uh, that are, you know, litter the landscape across the South. But I was kind of, like you say, I'm coming at this as, as a Northerner, um, as a transplant. And at first the orientation was very much a sort of third person. Um, it can, I don't think you can use objective without quick scare quotes in it anymore. So a sort of objective account, uh, you know, very sort of journalistic detached. Um, and, and, you know, there was plenty, you know, it's like it's, you're, you're accounting for centuries of American history. Um, there's all this reporting to do, archives to visit, monuments, battlefields to trudge through. Um, and so I didn't, like, maybe more damningly, maybe didn't feel like there was space for me to be self-reflexive, that this was, this was a story about other people, about another place. Um, but the, the massive reorientation that happens after reading Lillian Smith is that like her insights into the the real psychosis of American ideas of race, um, and and more pointedly that 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 race is a white problem, um, I think really brought home to me that I have a stake in this too, and that idea regional ideas of difference are are pretty convenient for white Northerners. Um, Robert Penn Warren calls it the treasury of virtue. <laughs> it's pretty um, you know this idea that by dint of our association with the Union Army, the Union Army as this, you know, great emancipating force, as, you know, as, as we like to tell ourselves, um, then we're sort of, you know, karmically golden um, and don't have to be self-reflexive about the way um, race and white supremacy continue to shape our lives uh, in the North. Um, and so, you know, that, that was, a, that was a, a necessary and an important reorientation to thinking about how race works in America and how race has shaped my life. You know, uh, this sort of received wisdom growing up is like, it's a problem of hearts. It's a problem that's in people's hearts. And insofar as it's still a problem, it's a problem down there. And not thinking about all of the ways in which, um, stuff that was coming up in the last panel, the ways that we buy houses, for, subsidize white people buying houses through FHA loans, um, all the way back to the Homestead Act, the GI Bill, uh, the Social Security Act of 35, you know, who that includes, who that excludes, how we fund school. So all of these ways, like the, the lines on which my life has been built are all shaped by race. And, and, and I think that the sort of shift into making a lot of, having a lot of those epiphanies come from, um, from, reading, from reading Smith's work. Yeah. You know, something I was thinking about right before we got on this call is a conversation that I don't know that we ever resolved, but it, it had to do with the fundamental uh, difference between our view of what white people think about. <laughs> you remember this? Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm just going to put you on the spot here because I, I, I think I know where I came down. I think I know where you came down, but I also feel like so much has happened in the last three years in these conversations since we probably first had this conversation. But it was this fundamental idea of what do white people think about racism, right? Like, and my, my recollection is that your argument was white people know deep down that there is something horrific about their history, about who they are as a people, and that there is a, there's a sort of baseline horror that operates somewhere in their hearts and that all their life is to mask that horror. And I think my argument is an extraordinarily cynical person. And I can't remember what Chip's, Chip, I think, oscillated, but and he could speak for himself. I think maybe Chip was on my side initially, and then he went to your side. I think my I side like, beat him over dinner one night and got over <laughs> yeah, my I think that's what I remember too. Um, my side was that they do not believe that they are wrong at all, that they are incapable of feeling that there is any historic injury at all, and that 
they say that aloud, but they don't just say it to mask something. They say it because they really truly believe it. Um, and I don't know how this is helping this panel, but I'm curious if you've had any further thoughts about that or if you've got yeah. if your argument right. Yeah, no, no, that's right. I think it, it, the, the genesis for it was thinking about Sheriff Clark in mm. Selma and the sort of the rages that he would go into mm -hmm. uh, defending the Dallas County Courthouse good. during the during the voting rights campaign in Selma and the, you know the, those first months of '65, um, and I think just like the images of, of of his face, the the sort of the way that he would he would fly at people, <laughs> um, um, Annie Lee Cooper most famously because it was it was photographed, um, but but just thinking that like he his whole life is predicated on this this lie that he is in, inherently better than these black people who are trying to register to vote. Um, and that that lie, uh, and there's there's so much of th that movement is, is meant to very dramatically, very publicly um, send up that lie and expose that lie. And I think that is, I've, I've read, I mean, I'm, I'm projecting all over the place here, but I think to armchair psychologize about it, like my read on that is that he, the lie is being exposed and that is what is provoking him to such, to such right. ends. Um, and, and, you know, I think, I, you know, if you look, if you go back and you look at the colonial Virginia in the seven, in the, the sort of second half of the, the 17th century, they had post Bacon's rebellion, they have this massive problem of indentured Europeans finding sort of class solidarity, a, a, a nascent class solidarity with enslaved for life Africans. And so you can see like the colonial legislature, the planter class starting to construct what we now think of as whiteness in, in Virginia offering, you know, what Du Bois would go on to call the wages of whiteness. This, mm -hmm. like these minor sort of laws that um, afford them this, this psychological sense of superiority that is completely out of nowhere. And of course, you know, there's no <laughs> biological basis for these differences of race. It's a political construction. They form this sort of, you know, solidarity along race and yeah. instead of along, you know, any sort of like common interest beyond that. And, and I think that that, like, it, it, it comes from that. It comes from so, so Machiavelli in a place, so pernicious a place, so violent a place, um, that even if it's subconscious, I think, I don't know, I guess it's just like my, my inclination, my worldview, but I yeah. think, I think they, we know it and it deranges us. So even if we, uh, even the, the folks who, who give voice to white supremacist ideas and, and, and appear to believe in them, I think at some level they know it's a lie and it is, it is crass yeah. self-interest, you know, calming a sort of uh, psyche that has been built on, on this lie. Yeah, yeah. The reason I thought about that is because before we got on this panel, I was just flipping through Pillars of the Dream and it and I see her working through the same question, which is what is what is sustaining this mythology and this lie that that informs everything about my world? And I think my argument, which is much more pessimistic about human nature, <laughs> has always been that the ideology that created white supremacy is so powerful that there it, the sustenance of that of that powerful narrative uh, becomes a goal in and of itself, and so the idea that there might be any kind of morality behind it to to question the sustenance of it is impossible to imagine. Now, I will say hmm. we talked about this a bit this morning when you and I talked before the panel, but um, there's something that happened this summer which was shocking to me, which was all these white people saying. Uh, maybe this stuff matters. I mean, all these people in my life, for instance, who were saying, my father, who is a liberal and, and has, uh, I think, come a really long way in the, in the time that I've known him toward thinking in a much more racially uh, sensitive way and to think, to think about racial injustice as something that has undergirded his life, which was something as a child, I could never imagine my dad thinking that. Um, mm -hmm. But we were on a bike ride this summer and he was talking at length about being emotionally moved by the protest, not just sort of intellectually moved, but just feeling the wages of whiteness. Like, what does it mean to have been, to have inherited all this privilege and all this stuff? And so, I I don't I'm not making the claim that somehow 
America has changed, but it does maybe to your uh, point, there, there are some inklings of in that inside those months and maybe they're gone now. I don't know. I mean, I'm not, I'm too cynical to say that they're going to stay around forever and we'll see what happens on November 3rd. Um, but it, fe it felt like maybe to your point, there was a moment where people began to see that maybe you could let down your guard enough to acknowledge that it was a lie and that that lie had actually done a lot to support your well-being and your life and, um, and all that. Yeah, it's funny, you know, I, I don't, I guess, I guess when I say they, they know on some level that it's a lie, I don't read any sort of moral validation in that. Mm, yeah. um, it, because I, I'm not, I'm not sure that it, 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 it then suggests some kind of change or reevaluation. Um, I mean, I think, I think that's one way to read the sort of the Unite the Right rally from 2017 yeah. is like they, you know, there, of course, so many of them are white supremacists and uh, who know you can't look into each of their hearts and know what what they believe or what they think is a lie but what you see is them having to ask for things that they didn't have to ask for before what what used to just come by virtue of being white in this country they now feel is being taken away from them mm -hmm. that they are somehow you know under uh, under political persecution and they need to march through the streets to demand the things that this country just used to afford them um psychologically but also materially um yeah. And, and I think that they sort of, I think that some of them at least know it's a lie and that, but they're still, they're asking for it anyway. They're parading in the streets and offering seg hails to Donald Trump anyway. Yeah. So there's no, I don't, I don't see any sort of, I don't, I, I don't see a, a moral arc in it, but I think that on some level, I think they do know that it's um, the system that they're, they're draw their prerogatives from is, is bullshit, but they, yeah. I think they still like it because it's, their prerogative well it's their bullshit too well yeah <laughs> i mean we always love the we always love the it's the that's the to me the most striking thing in killers of the dream is the the sort of um sequence with uh, at the summer camp with the with the white mm -hmm. girl and listening to lillian smith explain how race operates and how privilege operates et cetera, et cetera. and this girl comes into her office just angry it's mad that there's that what she has done, what Lillian Smith has done, is essentially destabilized her entire life. And yeah, she made said, it untenable. Yeah, it's totally untenable. And she said, I just flagged it a minute ago. My copy is like, if you just, this is one of those books that like, I can't read it because it's so filled with marginalia, <laughs> I can't even see. Um, but uh, she says, if you, the little, the girl says, if you hated your family, it would be easier to fight for what is right down here. It would be easier if you didn't care how much you hurt them. Mm -hmm. um, I say that because I'm, you know, working on some stuff that potentially could really hurt my family about our past and our, and I, and I'm trying to wrestle with like how much do I want to do that? You know? Um, so yeah, it's, uh, we, we should take some questions for sure. Cause we could keep, obviously keep talking about this. Well, I was going to say that the personal level of y'all's conversation is really great. And that I always go to that passage too, Andy, where, where that girl says, you know, you basically want me to hate my family essentially. Yeah. And then, you know, Lillian goes through that whole kind of discussion of, she doesn't give historical like pinpoint days, but she goes through the whole history of the construction of race um, through the slave trade, enlightenment, civil war, reconstruction, everything else. So yeah, thank you very much. And I love seeing the baby stroller in the background, Connor. <laughs> I should have tied it up a little bit. You can see the broom there too. <laughs> um, yeah, there's a couple of questions here and y'all can read them. And one of the questions I think that stuck out and I was trying to think of an answer to this question and I can't, I mean, the only person I can answer is, um, Janine Crusette, who's actually Cuban American. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the question was a lot of people are writing about whiteness these days, uh, but who do you think is writing on the topic with the power and beauty of Smith? Or more accurately, or more accurately with at least some of that power and beauty because there's only one Lillian Smith? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. I feel like in many ways, Connor is more equipped uh, to answer that question because he's a lot better read than I am. Um, but I will also make a broader observation about what I see happening in the space of writing about whiteness. And I think that it's in many ways a fraught space. I mean, I remember when White Fragility came out and we, I think we, we read that book among dozens of others. Um, and I don't think I even finished it, but I, you know, it's like a book that I have that I, it's like, you know, scholars know what this is like. You have something and then you just look at it and you read a little bit of it. You feel like you've read it, but you haven't really read the whole thing. And then there's this whole backlash to that book. I think, you know, right, rightfully so. Um, and so there's, there is a, 
we are in a time where writing about these political, what end up essentially being political issues is so fraught that it's hard, I think, to find a voice like someone like Elaine Smith in nonfiction. I think maybe in fiction, you might be easier to find, it might be easier to find someone who's able to articulate those kinds of things and, and speak from a place of personal experience and not feel the burden of having to speak for an entire movement, which is what I think a lot of writers and scholars feel as though the sort of Twitter world of opinions has uh, gotten a little bit toxic. It's hard to say anything without having there be some, and this is not by any means a defense or a, uh, or a criticism of cancel culture, which is a kind of boogeyman bullshit thing anyway. Um, but I do think there's something legitimate to the feedback loop, the instantaneous feedback loop that, uh, that people who write things about race and identity at this point, um, it can be a little disabling. So maybe we should look to fiction, I guess is my answer. Um, <laughs> That yeah. reminds me of, yeah. the, the, I didn't mean to cut you off, but, but George Yancey mentioned something about, you know, what are you willing to, are you willing to die for it, basically? Mm. And he didn't necessarily mean physically, he was like, what are you willing to give up? And the documentary, the, the short video clip that I showed to Smith talks about everything that she basically sacrificed with what she was doing. Right, right. And I haven't read White Fragility, but she does use Smith as an epigraph in that book, too. Yeah, yeah. And I, and I think about going to fiction moving back to what Jennifer Morrison talked about too, um, Welcome to Bragg's, well, I think is a good book that does that. Mm. Fiction. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's a great book. Um, there's a there's an interesting essay that came out this summer by um, from Boyce Upholt uh, in Guernica, who's writing about, trying to explore what it means to be a, 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 a white writer in the South writing about food. And he talks about um, a conversation that he had with Tunde Wei who's an activist and, and, and chef in New Orleans, who's, who basically challenged him to give him his house that like he had, he had, he had bought. He's, he's provocative in this way, Tunde Wei is, but um, saying to Uphold, like, you should just, you should give me your house. Like you have, you, you've been able to buy property writing about this food that you, as a guy from Connecticut, have no connection to. And, and the way that he sort of explores the, the contradictions um, of, of, of being a white person writing about race in America, I think is really great. And he ends it, to, to your point, Matt, he ends it in a, in a way, in a, on a similar note. Tunde Wei asked him, you know, like, what are, what are you willing to give up? And he says, not nearly enough. Um, so yeah, so I think that, that essay from, from Boyce Uphold is really good. Um, I think Alicia Kennedy, I'm reading a bunch about food right now, but Alicia Kennedy is an incredible writer about food and excavating um, issues of colonialism and race and whiteness that are present in, in present day food culture. Um, John Bewin has this amazing series called Seeing White um, that he does with Chandra Kumanika. Um, and then, you know, um, Adam Surer at The Atlantic and, and, uh, is, you know, dropping heat rock after heat rock about, about race in America. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I'm, you know, I, I love Welcome to Braxville too. Um, yeah, but, but I think, uh, yeah, I don't know. We can uh, recite bibliographies all day, but <laughs> those are a couple that come to mind. You're dropping stuff that I haven't heard of. You know, I, I know I know the guy from the Atlantic, but I haven't read any of Boyce's stuff or anything else that you mentioned. Now, I put a link. I just found his web page and put a link to his essays. I don't know if that essay is on there, but I put it um, in the chat to attendees and to all. So an oh. another question is: um, Each of you have used the word epiphany. Um, is that is that moment, quote unquote? key to seeing the world another way, do you think? Yeah, I mean, for me it is, and for and as a storyteller it is too, in the sense that I think one of the things that we talked about a lot in Making White Lies was trying to, if anybody's listened to White Lies, there's this kind of essayistic thing that happens at the very end of the show, um, which is basically a pretty clear statement that the world as it exists is predicated upon white supremacy. <laughs> I mean, it's, as, it's as clear as you can say that on an NPR program, I think. Um, and for a long time, that sequence was the very beginning of the show. Uh, and there's a long story about that, about how it changed in the process of editing that we all went through to sort of figure out that, that wasn't the right place for it. But I, I think that's a great example of, of the storytelling moves that we wanted to make because we wanted to make sure that that idea um, could be something that people could have an epiphany around, that people could feel hit in a certain way. And looking back on it, it's incredibly foolish that 
uh, we, and really I think I wanted it at the very beginning for a very long time, thought that somehow we should start the show that way because it would have completely stripped the ability for an audience to come to that place and have us land on that idea and land on that proclamation really and have that be the last thing you feel. Because from a structural standpoint, we wanted to design the show so that you are slowly being sucked in to the ideas that we're expressing about the ways that white supremacy operates. So that by the end of the show, in the final minutes, when you can't turn it off because you already listened to it all, you are left with this kind of declaration about the way the world operates. Um, and so, yes, I think a, an epiphany is extraordinarily important for me on a personal level because those are the those are the moments that stick with me. The feeling of like finding a usable past to use that thing I talked about earlier, finding that in history, finding someone like William Smith or Virginia Durr, um, you know, or or. I don't know, Walker, or, or there's so many different names I come up with that I found from the middle 20th century that Rose Gladney introduced me to really, that made me think, oh, there's a way for me to think about who I am as a Southerner. That's not the conventional way, not the way that I've been taught to think about myself. Um, and so, yeah, I think epiphany is super important. I'm Connor, I don't know what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, I, I think they're sort of tectonic, like there's, there's, there's pressure building and building and building and then there's something that can can pierce it do you pierce tectonic plates you don't pierce tectonic plates they have ruptures <laughs> yeah. that, that's something um, really powerful i think um and and yeah great I mean, yeah i i'm a I, I sit around and read books all day so they they often come in the form of, of of reading i guess but but i think it's it's always it's underwritten by other experiences that you're having ideas you've been exposed to people you're encountering or used to encounter we don't really encounter people anymore <laughs> but but yeah and then i think in hindsight it's like oh my god that was the thing this that was like the watershed moment um but yeah i think they're incredibly important partly because i think partly for white people they're they're important and, and almost become a kind of cliche um, because so much about American life encourages us not to have those epiphanies, doesn't draw our attention to the way that race operates. We, we get to sort of assume that we're the norm, that we're the stock photos. Um, we, don't, we don't know the water that we're swimming in. And so then there are those moments where we do, um, where we do feel it. So yeah, I think it's, you know, and they can be cringy. They can be not particularly revelatory. Sometimes they come as a result of an incredible amount of black suffering. Um, and then we kind of pat ourselves on the back for finally seeing something that people have been pleading for us to see for centuries. Um, but yeah, I mean, they, I think they do come in the form of epiphanies. Whether that's yeah. good or not, I don't know, but. Yeah. Your comment your comment about um, swimming in the water, I don't remember who did it, but the the pool safety ad where all the, all the black children, because it was all children, were doing the bad things, all the white children was behaving. Mm. I, I just I didn't find it real quick when I looked it up, but but that's what you're talking about. I mean, the way that whiteness is normalized, right? Mm -hmm. And it goes back to what George Yancey was saying, Professor Yancey, about the fact criminal or criminalized the way the way we think about those words. I forgot exactly the two words he used, but the way we think about you know being good or being bad, right? Even the words black and white specifically connotations with that. Mm -hmm. Let's end on this one question. Um, and I, I don't know this name, so I'm probably gonna mispronounce it, I apologize, but there's more discussion now about racialized trauma with works like um, Resma um, Menachem's My Grandmother's Hands. Um, how as white storytellers do you acknowledge racialized trauma? And I think y'all mentioned this some in White Lies, specifically why y'all do um, James Reeb's story instead of say, Jimmy Lee Jackson's story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we thought a lot about that. I think I think the reason why we told that story um, was because it was uh, white perpetrators of this crime and a white victim of that crime. And of course, it was in the context of the civil rights movement, which is untold injury and death and trauma to black folks. But, and of course, their labor that actually changed everything as opposed to the labor of white people like James Reeve, although I would say that's equally important in certain ways. But certainly not putting themselves on the line. At least Reeb didn't think he was coming down to someone to be attacked and killed, let's put it that way. Um, and so I think we were very conscious of not wanting to tell a story that dwelt in the trauma of black folks because it didn't feel like our story to tell. And it also felt so familiar. And so, and I don't, I don't mean that like, oh God, enough about the black trauma. I mean, enough about white people talking about black trauma. That's the problem that I have is that it's not really that's not the that's not the beginning and end of the story. That's the that is part of the reason why the protests this summer, as as enlightening and as wonderful as they were in certain ways, 
um, you do wonder the limits of those protests because if it's only about empathy and you've got this moment of empathy that you feel and it activates you in a certain way, but then there's, well, how many, how many other videos do you need to see of atrocities happening to, to black men at the hands of police? Um, you know, what, what is this the, the thing that broke the dam, right? But did it really break the dam? It's like, it's, it's easy for us to feel the activated by these, these traumatic stories. Um, so yeah, I think we have been very conscious of not wanting to tell stories that deal with the suffering. I mean, they do deal with the suffering of black and brown people, but they don't, that's not the, that's not the, that's not the pretext of the show. And that's not the pretext of the story. And the question that she, I see there's a clarification here, the sort of how do you acknowledge trauma held in, in your body or other white bodies, I think is a very interesting one because that is, and I wouldn't call it trauma, but the way that we use our own slaveholding past in white lies, um, it, it is a trauma to a certain extent. And I'm not trying to equalize these things, but it is traumatic that my family, for instance, when that show came out, my, my, my uncle called my mom and was like, now, where did Andy hear about this, uh, you know, hear about this slave, the, these slave owning our family? Because I don't know if he's right about that, you know? Um, and there's this kind of, that, that's, I haven't talked to my uncle about it. He didn't really want to talk to me about it, you know? Um, I've told a national audience that our family owns slaves. I mean, it's, this is not a thing that he wants to, to deal with. That is a low level family trauma. Like it's not even a trauma, but in terms of how white people deal with the pain of the reality of our past, I think it is something that white people need to hear white people talking about this. This is not for black people to hear. I mean, they are welcome to listen, but they don't need to hear it because they'd be like, give me a fucking break, frankly. Uh, but white people need to hear other white people talking about this stuff to make sense of how and if you can be honest about who you are as a, per as a person and, and where you came from, you know? Um, so yeah, I think that's, that's one, one sort of idea. I don't know, Connor, if you have thoughts about that too. Yeah. Um... Robert Penn Warren talked about uh, people having to sort of experience a kind of symbolic death and to, to kind of be able to, to get out from under and see the, the sort of insidious way that, that, that white supremacy has formed white Americans' lives. And then only then, only through that sort of symbolic death can they begin to find a way of living in a way that is outside of that. So I think it, because, and, and you have to let so many ideas die, so many received wisdom, experience this alienation from family, from the people around you who, 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 who don't want to think about these issues, don't want to address the inequities um, that, that, that undergird our lives. Um, so, so it is a sort of uh, uh, a traumatic thing. I, uh, yeah, but it's also like, it's it's also the only like you how else do you know yourself you sort of it's it's it is it's productive it's it's productive pain it's a growing pain um it's i mean it's but it's 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 a little remedial too it's almost like teething you know thinking about that because my child is about to start teething but but i think it, it's like yeah that that is a pain but it is like i'm 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 awakening to a consciousness that I probably should have come to a long time ago and it's yeah it's hard to get there and it's alienating in certain ways to get there um but it's it, 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 oh there, there's so much we could talk about and I always gotta bite my tongue I'm sorry um no go ahead but 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 I think about and, and I had something specific I wanted to end on kind of kind of like the podcast and I, I think about her talking and of reverting back to toilet training is kind of the word she uses i think right mm -hmm. reverting back to to childhood training and not wanting to move forward and i'm gonna go and share them now since we're wrapping up but but there are a couple of images that i always share with students i want to share this tweet with y'all as well um before we close but i always think of this image right here now i don't know how many of you have ever seen this image before i always share this with my students and i saw this initially in montgomery I think the Civil Rights Museum, uh, maybe the SPLC's museum, it wasn't the EJI, but it wasn't until I moved to Northeast Alabama that I realized this picture was taken 30 miles south of where I am now in Gainesville, Georgia. You're not showing us a picture, Matt. Yeah, and it was 30 miles in 1992, and we have no clue who the kid is there. We're looking, at your, I, we're looking at your tweet deck. Oh, my bad. Sorry. Let me, let me, let me give the picture. This should be the picture. All right, y'all see it? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. So I don't know how many of you have seen this picture before, but like I said, it, it's one that has always stuck out to me. This one and another one I'm going to show you. 
And it sticks out with me even more now with Lillian Smith because when you initially see it, oh, it's, it's something hopeful. It's a, it's a white kid in a KKK robe, two years old maybe, looking at a black state trooper, right? But if you really look at it, he's not looking at this trooper. He's looking at himself. Hmm. He's looking at his own reflection. <laughs> That's what Smith talks about, is, look, is the narcissism of looking at yourself and ignoring everything around you because they spoke with the officer like 20 years later. I was like, this kid was oblivious to me. He didn't know I was even there. And of course the mom comes and scoops the kid up. But the mm -hmm. other image I always think about is this. This is, I shared this in the, in the, um, in the chat, but this is a piece, I, I actually wrote this piece about March. And those scenes that Andrew Iden was talking about when the Freedom Riders came into Montgomery and you see Nate Powell's art with the the white kid reaching out actually and i forget the guy's name i'm james eric reaching out of his eyes and his father goading him on you know that's my boy get him mm -hmm. and i always think of this image right here these are two images from the naacp's um an art commentary on lynching and i always think about the one on the right and i'll and this is uh reginald marsh's this is her first lynching and i always think of this image because it eliminates the trauma from one. The one on the left doesn't. I forgot who did that one. Uh, Paul Cadmus, I think. But the one on the right, you don't see the victim. You don't see the black man or woman or child being murdered and lit ablaze. You see the town, the white townspeople holding the white girl up. And you see their, their ghastly faces and you see her kind of an innocent gaze. And it reminds me of what Dr. Watson was talking about, what others were talking about, about education and where we go and tying all this together. And I think those are two really important images to look with students or with anybody to kind of talk about these things. Then this is a follow-up, of course, in March. But I want, I want to leave it with that, unless you'll have something to say, um, Andy and Connor. There's one more thing I want to say too, but if there's anything y'all want to wrap up with and then we can. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I mean, we, feel really fortunate that you ask us to speak um and i wish we could all be together and and go have a beer now <laughs> and, and are together and clink glasses and talk more about all this um but i really appreciate you putting this together and uh i'm just thrilled frankly and i've told you this before personally but that the lillian smith center exists and that y'all are doing the work you are to preserve her legacy because it it feels like she's more vital than ever right now and it just doesn't feel like she's getting out there as much as she should. So I think we should all we should all be emboldened to find ways to get her out into the world and get that this conversation started again. And and we have some we have some panelists that are still here from the other panels too, if they want to say anything too. Like I said, there's one there's there's one thing I want to end up on, but I'll let them Jane put her video back on. I think Sarah and Jacina and Veronica are still here. I put my video on by accident, so I apologize. I'm, I'm, I'm in space at this point, but this has been fantastic listening today. It's really been a wonderful day. Thank you, Matthew, for organizing it. I wanna thank all y'all for being here. And I wanna wrap up with this. I mean, if, there, if there's something you can do, one of the attendees actually pointed this out to us that, um, and this is on Twitter, and we can continue these conversations on Twitter or elsewhere too, you can email me, but Lee Arendelle, which is actually the prison here for women in Habersham County, has been without water for, with clean water for a week. We've had issues Jesus. here in Habersham. Wow. So if you want to, um, of course, amplify that or write anybody, I know that some of you have contacts that you can, mm -hmm. you can talk to, I'm gonna try and figure out who to contact here. I'm not sure who to contact exactly, but the county commissions, maybe I have a few people I can, I can reach out to. So just to let you know. Hmm. Wow, that's awful. Thank you for that. Okay. I appreciate y'all being here. Uh, follow us on Twitter, specifically at LES uh, underscore center. I did put some things in the, in the um, chat. We did actually have a podcast with, with Andy about Lillian Smith and White Lies, where he talked about this a little bit more. We actually have a podcast with Donald in Washington where we talk about comics and Lillian Smith, which I think is really interesting considering um, Andrew Iden's discussion and the role that comics have um, in these types of discussions. I would also say too, we have a reading group. I'll put this in the chat too. We have a reading group coming up next Tuesday if you're interested and you can look that up. I'll put that in the chat as well. I'll leave the slideshow playing for about 15 minutes if you want to catch the slides or anything. And then I'll head out. If We, will, we did record this. Um, I'll see if I can save the chat. I see that right there. 
and I'll see if I can maybe put it up somewhere. I'm not sure if I can save the exact chat for just attendees or not. I have to look and see. So I'm not sure about that. But I'll figure something out. Maybe I'll do like a bibliography. I'll save it for myself and then construct a bibliography and put it on the website. Maybe I'll do something like that with links. But these will these are recorded and we'll try and edit them and get them up, you know, a couple a week or two maybe. So they will be able to share and use in class. Okay. Thank you. All right. Well, thanks so much, Matt. I appreciate it. Say hello to the baby. We'll get a beer sometime. Looking forward to it. Yeah, just as soon as we're able. Yeah, and I'm looking forward to reading your book too. I know it just came out. Yeah, thanks, man. Let me know what you think. I will. All right. Cool. Y'all have a good night. Thank y'all. Thanks, everyone. Time.